Um, so let's begin, we'll read it through, and then I'll ask some questions about it, and we'll try to uh, unpack the meaning. Jesus, of course, is comparing the kingdom of God to different realities, and he says this, verse 14. It will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two. To another, one. Each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now he also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, uh, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not winnow. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sowed, and gather where I have not winnowed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But for him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. All right, pause there. Whew, that's a rough, that's a rough parable. Uh, a lot going on there, a lot of twists and turns. So let's just walk through it step by step. The first question we want to ask here is, what exactly was a talent, right? What's the situation being described here? And what was the unit of measure being described? So Jesus sets up a situation, the context here is of a master with his servants. He goes off into a foreign country and he leaves them his money in order for them to make investments with the money. Now, the unit of money being described here, a talent, was in fact a large amount of money. Um, we don't know exactly how much because uh, the unit would differ on whether it was a silver talent or a gold talent, that would be the, the most uh, valuable of all. But just as an example, scholars would point out that one silver talent was about 15 to 20 years worth of wages, of daily wages, okay? So that's a lot of money, even if you only get one talent. And in this case, the master leaves five to one servant, two to another servant, and then one to a third servant, right? And it's interesting here that you'll notice in that line, it says that he gave the talents each according to his ability. Okay. That is your first little clue here that this that something more is going on in this parable than just a kind of straightforward story about investing money, right? That what we're talking about here is Jesus, or God, being like the master, who is then bestowing gifts upon us, his servants, but not equally. It's not equally distributing them. This is important. The talents are not given equally, but each person according to their ability, right? This, by the way, is where we get the actual word talent from in English. So we talk about someone being talented. We are using an ancient uh, Jewish or Greco-Roman monetary uh, unit in order to talk about as a figure for someone's innate gifts, right? That one person is more talented than another person at music. Why? Well, because they have a kind of natural gift to do a better job, to be a better musician than someone else. Someone else might be more talented at math 
uh, than, than me. That's not hard because I'm terrible at math. Uh, because they have a natural, innate ability to, um, to, to solve math problems and to do it well. Anyway, so the whole very, the English word talent actually comes from this parable. So very significant here. So the master is giving each of these uh, different distributions of money to the servants on the assumption that while he's away, they're going to use them well, they will invest them, and then he'll get the return when he returns at the end. Okay, so what happens? The master comes back after a long time, uh, in verse 19, to settle accounts with the servants. And you can see here, the first servant has doubled his investment. So what does the master say to him? Uh, well done. Enter into the joy of your master. Right, pause. Now there's another clue that this is not just a story about investments. This is about the kingdom of God, right? Uh, just like the entering into the wedding feast in the parable of the ten virgins was a metaphor, was a figure for entering to the eternal wedding feast of the kingdom of heaven, so too this idea of entering into the joy of the master is a figure for entering into the joy of the kingdom. I think that's something worth dwelling on to think about, uh, to ponder, that one of the essential aspects of heaven is not just eternal life, which is, that's great. I mean, eternal life is great. But think about being joyful for all eternity, right? Especially in our day and time when so many people battle with anxiety and depression, sadness and fear, uh, pain and hurt. Think about moments in your life where you've had joy, like real joy. And then multiply that times infinity and eternity. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. And that's what the master is inviting the servants into, right? If the master is God, come into the joy of your master. Now, that's the first two servants, though, right? The third servant um, does not do the same. So the first servant doubles his investment. The second servant doubles his investment. But then the third servant reacts differently. Look how he reacts. This is interesting. Uh, when the master comes to settle the accounts, he says, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow and gathering where you didn't win. Pause there. I don't know if you noticed this, but he just insulted the master. He basically called him a thief, right? Uh, because when you, when you um, reap where you didn't sow, that means you, you take what belongs to someone else, right? So if you sow your field and then you go reap your field, you're taking the fruits of what belongs to you. But if you reap what you didn't sow, you're basically stealing from someone else. So what is this servant's concept of his master? He thinks of his master as a hard man. In other words, someone who's unforgiving, who's selfish, and also as a kind of a thief, right? Who steals from people. And so his response to the master is fear. He doesn't trust the master. He doesn't want to give joy to the master by making an investment with the master's money. He's just in his fear, he takes that one talent and he buries it in the ground, right? Why? Well, so that he can just give the master back what belonged to him, right? That's his security is in just giving what him what belongs to him anyway, right? This is a twist. Uh, this is one of those twists that Jesus' parables have. Why would anyone do this, right? It, it really is an irrational act. If the master is so generous to give you freely one, one talent, which would be about 15 to 20 years worth of wages, right? So I don't know. Let's see, I'm going to try to do some math here. <laughs> I shouldn't do this. But if it's 20 years worth of wages, let's say it's like $50,000 a year. What would that be? It's like a million dollars, right? So if, he, if, if an annual salary would be around $50,000 a year, and the master gives him a talent that's worth 20 years worth of wages. He just gave you a million dollars. If someone gives you a million dollars, that should be a clue to you that they're generous, right? That they're not the kind of person who is a hard man, who's very selfish with what belongs to them. Much less if he gives someone five talents, right? Like five million dollars to do with as you will to invest as you will, to use as you will. So the servant here has a twisted vision of the master. He doesn't understand who the master is. Not only does he 
not recognize that the master is generous. He even thinks the master is a thief. Right? He takes what doesn't belong to him. Right. I think this is really telling. Because one of the things it shows us is how sin distorts our understanding of God. It actually made, makes me think of Genesis chapter 2. If you remember, after Adam and Eve fall, what do they do? They're afraid of God, and they go and they hide from God. Because their understanding of God is not as a generous father who wants to give them everything, who gave them life and gives them dominion over the whole world, but their idea of God after they sin is altered. They think of him as a tyrant, as someone who's out to get them, who wants to withhold good things from them, of someone who, of whom they should be afraid. That's how the third servant thinks of his master, right? He's fearful, he's anxious, and he's irrationally depicting the master as selfish and as a thief, right? Which, by the way, can God be a thief? No. Everything that exists is from him. It all belongs to him. So even when we give him something, we're simply giving back to him what was his to begin with, right? Every gift that we have is ultimately from him anyway. So in this case, this servant here fails to, to invest the master's money. And the master responds 